We are going to begin the funeral service for Mr. Thomas F. Pick. Family, if you have a cell phone, I'd ask you kindly to place it in the silent mode at this time or turn it completely off. And I'd like to welcome friends and extended family and visiting us via live stream. Services will be conducted by Rabbi Samuel Gordon of Congregation Sukkot Shalom in Wilmette. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm honored to be here paying tribute to a friend, a supporter, someone who I so deeply admired and enjoyed spending time with. I share in your sense of sadness and loss on this day. Once again, we are gathered as family and community and friends only two weeks after the death and burial of Tom's beloved sister, Mary. They were separated by only 13 months in birth, and it is fitting that they are so tied together during this moment. With this family so rich in history connected over generations, the two of them were so deeply connected. I noted then at the time of Mary's death and burial, that it was around the time of Thanksgiving. And now we are here on the last night of Hanukkah. And this season between now and the New Year's is the time normally for family and friends to get together in gatherings, often in celebration, but also times of memory of telling stories, of remembering those whose presence is felt spiritually, even if the chair at the table is empty. We want to pay tribute to a remarkable man, a wonderful person, honor him and recall with love and admiration, just what an extraordinary person he was. Both, he was a character, but also a man of great and deep character of values that he passed on and shared with so many of you. We look to readings from the book of Psalms and others. First from Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes onto the mountains. What is the source of my help? My hope comes from the eternal one, maker of heaven and earth. God will not let your foot give way. Your protector will not slumber. Behold, the protector of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. The eternal one is your guardian. God is your protection at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. God will guard you from all harm. The eternal one will guard your soul. You're going out and you're coming in from this time forth and forever. The 23rd Psalm, Adonai Roi Lo Echsar, Vinotesha Yarabitseni, Almei Menachotje Nachalini Nafshi Oshovev. And please say with me, particularly those of you in the chapel and those on Zoom, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The poet Stephen Spender wrote this. I think it's fitting to think about this poem in terms of Tom's life, his vibrancy, the way in which he lived that life, his love of the environment, of music, of the arts. This is what Spender wrote. I think continually of those who were truly great, who from the womb remembered the soul's history through endless corridors of light, 
where the hours are suns, endless and singing, whose lovely ambition was that their lips, still touched with fire, should tell of the spirit clothed head to foot in song, and who hoarded from the spring branches the desires falling across their bodies like blossoms. What is precious is never to forget the delight of the blood drawn from ageless springs, breaking through rocks and worlds before our earth. Never to deny its pleasure in the simple morning light, nor its grave evening demand for love. Never to allow the traffic to smother with noise and fog the flowering of the spirit. Near the snow, near the sun, in the highest fields, see how their names are feted by the waving grass and by the streamers of white cloud and whispers of wind in the listening sky. The names of those who in their lives fought for life, who wore at their hearts the fire's center. Born of the sun, they traveled a short while toward the sun and left the vivid air signed with their honor. Each of us, I'm sure, could compose memories, a eulogy, a tribute to Tom. He touched everyone he knew and met so deeply. It is fitting, though, that those who were closest to him share their memories on this afternoon. I'm going to start by asking Nancy to come up and speak, and then she will introduce the other speakers following her. When I sat down to write this eulogy, I was struck by the name of the congregation my parents belonged to, Sukkot Shalom. A sukkah is a kind of hut, a temporary shelter built for celebrating the harvest. And I thought, you know, my father was a sukkah. As a sukkah, he wouldn't have been the fancy schmancy kind with gold trim. He would have been a little wonky and asymmetrical with odd vegetables hanging from the walls. The roof would definitely have been made of corn stalks because he once won a contest by eating, by eating, believe it or not, 17 ears of corn. By tradition, you should be able to see the stars through the roof of your sukkah, and that would be perfect for my stargazer father. When I was seven, he taught me my first constellation, Cassiopeia, the big W in the sky. And then 50 years later, he taught me a brilliant new star, Canopus, when I was visiting Sanibel. Canopus lies so far to the south that you can't ever see it in Chicago, but you can see it low on the horizon in Florida. Daddy loved that, and so did I. It wasn't just stars that my father observed, though. It was also the weather. My favorite sound from my childhood was three sharp taps. Daddy, tapping on the barometer, whose needle often stuck to see whether storms were coming. When the barometer was falling, we'd know a storm was brewing. And Chicago, as most of you know, can whip up some monsters. With his eagle eyes, Daddy was always scanning the skies for vertical development, the thunderheads that boded trouble. At night, when we were kids, whenever there was a heart-stopping crack of thunder right over the house, flash, boom. My dad would always make the rounds of our bedrooms, checking to make sure we were all right. It seems to me that this interest in storms and weather and stars was very much linked to his service in the Navy. He attended officer training school after he graduated from Amherst, and he served on the aircraft carrier Oriskany, working in the code room as the ship patrolled the Pacific. It's as if after he was discharged, his family and friends then became his aircraft carrier, and he needed to steer us all through rough waters, through the storms of life. Three dots are Morse code for the letter S. S for Sue, of course. My mom, the love of his life. How I wish that I could have sheltered him from the cruel storms of these last years, but sadly, I was powerless to. Mom protected him heroically 
We are all in awe of her devotion and strength. My father was also watched over by a team of extraordinary caregivers, George Luchik, Alexandra Garcia, Ophelia Rocha, Beatriz Rios, and especially Deborah Salisbury. They befriended him, laughed with him, and sought advice with him until nearly the end. They are pillars of loving kindness, and we are deeply grateful to them all. So here's the thing. A sukkah is deliberately designed to be a temporary shelter. Even if you live my father's 90 years, nearly 33,000 days on earth, you can provide only a temporary shelter over those you love. As for my dad's aircraft carrier, the Ariskany, the mighty O, it lies on the ocean floor, serving a second life as an artificial coral reef. Not long ago, I put up my own barometer on the wall, but I still listen for daddy's tap, 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 checking to see if storms are coming, making sure that all of us will be okay. Next to speak will be my sister, Sally Pick. Like daddy, I've perfected the art of circuitous rambling speeches. So here's one in your honor, daddy. Early this week, I imagined my dad seeing his, seeing his mother, Grandma Pick, after he died, greeting her in the hysterical manner in which he answered the phone when he expected her call saying, Walgreens. She would often hang up thinking she had the wrong number and then call back irate that my dad had fooled her and was so inappropriate. Humor was one of daddy's constants, even in his last year. He led and taught us by example and through activities. And for me, an important piece of that was teaching us sports and outdoor pursuits, which have been a source of joy in my life. He led and taught us by example. Not only did he explain the nuanced rules and strategies of baseball and football as he watched them on TV, he also taught us to play, even though he had three daughters and a son. He, we played wiffle ball, softball, and football in our yard. Through watching games and playing them in the backyard, I learned to love sports. I played softball on our high school team, intramural ball in college, and intermittently in leagues when I lived in Philly. When I spent my junior year in broad at University of Michigan, I stumbled on a women's football league. Having trained for years in our backyard, I played on a team as a sometime and mediocre quarterback, a punter and a pass receiver. Daddy would occasionally take us to Cubs games and I became a lifelong fan. When visiting my parents in Florida a year or two ago, I took daddy out to, to the lawn to play a gentle game of catch with the Nerf football. He still loved it and showed his deeply ingrained abilities. He taught each of us to, to downhill ski at Wilmot Mountain Ski Resort, a glacial moraine on the closest hill on our, uh, to our home. One time at the beginning of a huge snowstorm, he took Betsy and me to Wilmot. We stayed until late afternoon when we heard on the radio at the chairlift base that O'Hare Airport was closed. He drove us home carefully through blinding snow until we got to the driveway where for fun, he gunned the car into the deep snow. He, he was always up for adventure and fun. Sorry. He was always up for adventure and fun. And he inspired that in me and his other children. Another activity he did with all of us was winemaking. We would spend time with him in the third floor bathroom, helping him prepare the wine from cans of red grapes that he bought at a winemaking store. Nancy drew the label and daddy named the wine Chateau Porte Rouge after our red front door. He shared the wine with many friends at a huge New Year's party at our house, knowing with his typical humor and humility that he would be teased about its vinegar-like finish. He was also incredibly insightful and prescient talking with me years ago about living in a time of unprecedented comfort and unsustainable resource use. He saw this from constantly learning about commodities and commercial resource demands as an investment broker and a person inherently curious and devoted to learning about the world. 
This concern about the world and our environment extended to his love of nature and support for a wide range of environmental projects. Daddy, Daddy passed his love of nature and the environment to all of us. We watched a parade of birds on our bird feeder and oohed and odd when observing through binoculars a wood duck nest in a backyard tree. After an, an enormous thunder, after enormous thunderstorms would pass through, we would drive to a platform overlooking Lake Michigan to watch the cumulonimbus clouds flashing with lightning bolts. Once on vacation in St. Croix, he convinced me to get up pre-dawn, not my favorite thing, to watch Venus and the moon set over the water as a few fishing boats passed by. He knew I would appreciate the beauty and poetry of the moment. I was destined through nature and, an, and inspirational nurture to pursue an environmental career. Daddy, I will miss your humor, insights, integrity, steady and strong presence, kindness, generosity with a capital G, love of life and deep commitment to family. And now my twin sister, Betsy, will speak. How to say goodbye to your dad. I never called him dad, but rather daddy, as did my siblings. His, he left a legacy of values that will stay with me for life, one of which was his love for growing things. He was an avid gardener. He planted two small gardens, one with veggies and herbs and another with perennial flowers. Often he would pick an herb leaf, crush it between his finger and thumb, and have me smell the fresh scent. It was early aromatherapy. He grew, grew pole, pole beans that climbed up a tall, strange-looking metal pole rigged with strings running top to bottom. This crazy contraption is now proudly dis displayed in my yard. To encourage the kids, he gave us each our own small garden plot. There were often more weeds than plants, but it gave us all an early experience that led us to a lifelong love of living with nature. Daddy was always ready to share his gardening skills with anyone who came to visit. He took joy in walking visitors around the yard for a grand tour, naming all the plants along the way. He was an aggressive pruner. <laughs> when he saw a tree or a bush or a dead branch, he either snapped it off with his hands, or if the plant was lucky, he had his pruning shears and handsaw and promptly removed the offending limb. This was whether or not it was on our property. As my brother Charlie and his wife aptly said, was it a mitzvah or a misdemeanor? He taught me some of my, his trimming know-how. That inspired me to take pruning to the next level and become a trained, properly equipped, legal volunteer tree keeper. For many years, my father drove bottom of the line stick shift cars. I remember a boxy pale blue Opal, a little known Buick model, and there was the later recalled yellow Ford Pinto wagon with sleek fake wood paneling. When gold and silver prices went through the roof in the late 70s, my father and I drove to the city in the Pinto to a buyer's shop to sell some unwanted silver. On the way home, we unexpectedly stopped on a side street. He put me behind the wheel and told me to drive. I was only about 14 years old and terrified. We went herky-jerky down a block or two before he took back the wheel. Eventually, I mastered stick shift when I was legally old enough, thanks to his garden, uh, guidance. This was just among the few things that he taught me. My dad was fashion challenged. For years, he wore a red 007 sweatshirt while working in the yard. On weekends, he went, to, went on errands with his dirty, unmatched clothes without any sense of self-consciousness. Gradually, my mother's fashion influence won out and my dad was snappily dressed in starch button-down shirts and matching slacks. The notable exceptions were his early morning excursions across Wagner Road to the garden plot at his nearby rental, rental house. He wore his notorious pajamas with navy blue and white kimono robe. Although his speech was slow, my dad's mind was quick and sharply honed. He loved his weekly Sunday crossword and acrostic puzzles. I happened to visit him on a Sunday. One of his puzzle questions was the capital of Upper Volta, now Burkina Faso. We had to look it up in an atlas. It was pre-Google. The answer is, Ouagadougou, or is it Ouagadougou? 
We had endless fun debating the proper pronunciation of this odd word, and it became an ongoing joke. He loved wordplay, fake accent, purposely mispronouncing or forgetting people's names. He was bad at telling jokes, and his speeches were long, circuitous, and often didn't have an end, but were always heartfelt. I know that my father would not have arrived at his 90th year of life without the love and devotion of my mother and his incredible caregivers. Mom, you went the extra mile to always include Daddy in your outings, despite the burden it placed on you. Daddy, I love you, and you will live on in my... Uh, you will live on forever in my heart. The next speaker is my brother, Charlie Pick. Riding through the haze of grief is hard, but I've found solace in the kind words and deeds of my family and friends and through our shared memories of dad. We focus today not on the pain of his death, but on the meaning of his life, his impacts both big and small on those who knew him. For my part, my five plus decades with dad influenced me in ways I'm only now beginning to appreciate. I think my dad, who was cautious in many ways, was really an adventurer at heart. His stint with the Navy, sailing the world and exploring uh, exotic ports of call was one example. Anyone who knows me knows I love to travel and explore new places, and he always encouraged my adventures. Dad also loved real estate, land in particular, and I follow that same star. He once bought a five acre piece of high desert property near Alamosa, Colorado, sight unseen from an advertisement in Forbes magazine. Over the years, he brought several of the kids out to see the land to help connect personal meaning to the land as he did with so many aspects of his life. Years later, dad bought property adjoining his home on Drury Lane, not to build a mansion or a monument to himself, but rather to create more green space a natural habitat in the neighborhood. It's not surprising that all of his kids, including me, have good-sized lots where we can appreciate nature and dedicate ourselves to both its enhancement and, of course, its maintenance. My involvement with the Wetlands Initiative follows that example, firmly connecting me with the land and the natural world. Many of you know Dad for his sound business judgment and sharp analytical mind. He was at once patient, decisive, and decidedly not panicky in almost every situation. This served him well in the world of investing, where he took a steady-as-she-goes approach to owning stocks. He was methodical, insightful, and never, and never got caught up in the emotions of economic cycles or hype. For so many members of my family, he shouldered a huge load of personal and financial responsibility without expectation of praise or compensation. He offered clear, consistent, and kind advice and guidance to all those who needed it. With his passing, I inherit the weight of some of these responsibilities, but I also inherit the durability and patience to manage them. I will endeavor to honor his legacy and the long tradition of stewardship dating back to George Pick in the early 1900s, carried on by my grandfather, Frederick. Their portraits will hang in my office for inspiration. Of course, no story about dad is complete without mention of his great talent behind the grill. His barbecue skills are legendary, and to this day, I still use his red uh, Weber kettle grill for family, most recently grilling a 20-pound monster Thanksgiving turkey. My dad could grill anything, really, and our freezer at 990 Sheridan literally overflowed with all manner of meat, like a bad episode of the Brady Bunch featuring Sam the Butcher. He taught me the value of steady heat, a watchful eye, a good thermometer, and a measure of hardwood for flavor. One lesson I had to learn on my own, unfortunately, was not to substitute gasoline in place of lighter fluid to start the grill. I lost my eyebrows and my self-respect, uh, but I was never deterred from carrying on the tradition of meat and fire. I look forward to teaching my kids these skills over the coming years. This is the way. Dad, I will miss you a lot. I still have so many questions for you about fatherhood, manhood, responsibility, money, marriage, life, philanthropy, and most importantly, whether I should sell my Microsoft stock. <laughs> On my darker days, I'm angry that Alzheimer's stole my mentor just as I would need him the most over the past decade. But as the sun rises over a new chapter in my story, I can see that he gave me everything I need long ago. I just need to trust myself and listen to the inner voice 
that he nurtured. Rest in peace, Dad. I love you. Uh, now my uh, brother-in-law, Lawrence Douglas, is going to speak. So um, I have three stories uh, to tell about uh, Tom. The first is uh, from the very first time I went out to visit uh, the Picks. This was before Nancy and I uh, got married. And Tom very graciously uh, took me a tour of all the places of his haunts from when he was a child. And uh, we drove by the Lakeshore uh, Country Club and he said, well, this is where I used to play golf until I developed a neurological problem. And uh, I felt bad. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. What was that uh, problem? And he said, I sucked. Um, the second uh, story, it comes from uh, one of our fishing trips. Um, we, he took me very graciously, took me along on these beloved fishing trips of his. And uh, we were sitting in the lodge where we'd have our meals. And there was another group of uh, fishermen uh, in that lodge with us. And we started talking with them. And uh, Tom said that we had caught a few fish. And they started talking about their um, fishing successes. And they were like, yeah, well, I just caught like a 50 pound bass. And uh, my friend here, he caught a 70 pound bass. And I was sitting there kind of like rolling my eyes. And Tom was like, really? That's fantastic. And then afterwards, uh, Tom and I were walking back to our cop cabin and he turned to me and he said, uh, have you ever heard such a crock of bullshit in all your life? And then the third story, the third story I'll tell about Tom was, uh, this goes back to what uh, Charlie was mentioning and this was uh, Tom uh, barbecuing, I should say, actually um, smoking a turkey at our house. Um, it was tradition for everyone to fly out to our house in New England. Uh, for Thanksgiving and uh, Tom and Sue and the rest of them flew out on many occasions be uh, before uh, Tom's illness prevented him from doing so. And on one particular Thanksgiving, the weather was truly ghastly and foul. There was a lashing rain. It was maybe 36 degrees. And yet Tom was out there by our spherical Weber barbecue, smoking the uh, turkey while all of us were uh, comfortably inside, huddled around a fire, uh, sipping a uh, hot cider. And I went out uh, periodically to, to check on Tom, who was completely drenched, um, mon monitoring the, the, uh, the cooking. And I said to him, how are you doing? And he flashed me a big smile and he said, I couldn't be happier in the world. And that's really how I will remember Tom, my father-in-law, who had this incredibly generous and positive outlook at life. I mean, he was a good natured person who, for whom I will always remember that kind of wonderfully positive outlook at life. The next speaker will be Stephen Kochvar. For those who don't know me, my name is Stephen Kochvar. I'm Betsy Kochvar's youngest son. Grandpa Tom was undeniably eccentric, the kind of person who collects pig figurines and makes funny faces at not only his five-year-old grandkids, but also his 50-year-old children. Others have already spoken about his interests in astronomy, meteorology, philanthropy, and his various other passions. But what stays with me the most when I think of Grandpa Tom is his relationship with Grandma Sue. I can't speak for them, but from my perspective as their, grand, as their grandchild, their relationship was a model of a truly successful marriage. And yet, as I've heard it told, it was anything but love at first sight. On his way to their first date set up by mutual friends, Grandpa Tom got into a fender bender and was making a terrible face when he finally arrived to meet Grandma Sue. Talk about a literally bumpy start. Somehow, and I have no idea how, he managed not to scare her off. And before long, they were married and raising four wonderful and capable kids. During the time that I knew Grandpa Tom, he had a level of respect for and comfort around Grandma Sue and vice versa that can only be built up 
over decades of fully loving and trusting one another. They were a team, and to my, and to my eyes, their partnership was as assured as any law of nature. While grandma and grandpa made an enviable team, I noticed that they still gave each other the space to be their own individuals. Grandpa Tom, with his various hobbies of watching baseball, gardening, and observing the activity on the pond. Grandma Sue, with her ever busy social life, voracious reading, and her Herculean efforts planning the Sanibel Music Festival. In preserving their individuality, they were able to complement one another as people. His easygoingness balanced her organizational and planning abilities. Her gift as a conversationalist compensated for his sometimes awkward demeanor with the grandkids. And her natural grace made up for his table manners, <laughs> or lack thereof. In Grandpa Tom's final years, I watched as Grandma Sue redoubled her, her devotion to him. While sometimes I saw glimpses of his frustration at losing his independence, more often, I noticed a sense of peace and gratitude that he could spend his last and most vulnerable years with the woman he fell in love with 60 years before. All epic love stories come to an end eventually, whether through separation or in death. But in loving each other right up to the end of his life, Grandpa Tom and Grandma Sue showed me a shining example of how to live a good life, caring for, supporting, trusting, and leaning on the people you love. The next person to speak will be my grandpa's dear friend, Frank Hirsch. Hi, uh, I've known Tom an awful long time. And I say to all of you, what a wonderful, fantastic man he was, as you know. Uh, first, my condolences though to Bill, Ann, and David for the loss of their wonderful fine mother, Mary, and of course to Nancy, the twins, and to Charlie. <clears throat> Let me take you back to the days before our marriage, respective marriages, back to 1946, Teton Skyline Ranch in Wyoming. <clears throat> we had just crossed a river on horseback and were resting on a bank when a voice from behind me said, hello, I'm Mott Kasip. And I thought, what a strange introduction. And then I realized and I replied, and I'm Knarf. Thus began a lifelong relationship with Tom Pick and with Knarf and our mutual families. Camp was a disaster, as many of you know. Tom got pleurisy, and it, if it weren't for him uh, going back to Chicago and telling all the parents where we were, because we returned by a two-week bus trip, I don't know what they would have done. I lost contact with Tom in the next 10 years while both of us went to college, military service, and I returned to Chicago, my ancestral home, to start work and joined Lakeshore and again met Mark Kasiap. We and Tom, uh, the two of us and Tom Coleman took a Garrett apartment on the near north side of Chicago, 1534 North Dearborn. It really was a hovel, but we had fun because we were right in the action. And the stories of our living there were just legion. Tom had a perplexity for uh, being somewhat neat, but not entirely. In his room, there was a rat that used to run around and he had a baseball bat just in case. And I'll never forget the look of his mother, Frances, when she came in to see this hovel and she saw this bat and asked what it was. And he said, that's to kill the bat, the rat. The rat. Uh, he loved putting her on. Uh, Tom worked for Hillis and Annette and Printers while I was at work at Ryerson Steel. And he also loved to do, make, do little pranks. So he had an invitation printed of an open house at this little apartment of ours. And I knew we were in trouble when I was walking down the street one day and here was some guy handing out invitations to people crossing the street. I returned to our apartment that night and it was so damn packed, you couldn't have spilled a drink on the floor. 
uh, had you had a drink in your hand. I remember the time that Tom first met Sue. It was on a blind date fixed up by John Loeb. And he, we were going to go out on his little dinghy. I think it was called the Little O. And before we got to pick up Sue, there was a minor fender bender in the back. So by the time he got to her apartment, as Sue described it, he was rather frenzied and furrowed, and she probably thought she'd never meet him again. But that began, of course, uh, their friendship and eventual marriage. We've had such wonderful experiences together, and I sometimes wonder what it is that causes us or caused me to be such a good friend of his. And I think maybe it was our differences. And I, when I analyze it, I realize that we were really the opposite. Uh, I'm quick to do things. Tom was always ponderous and took his time to make decisions. I'm quixotic. He was uh, inflappable. I'm often uh, do irregular things. He is so was so consistent in his ways. I'm kind of conventional, following the uh, the crowd. He, of course, was eccentric, and I'm very flexible, wishy washy, and he was always unwavering. Maybe it was these differences that caused us to be such good friends. I don't know, but all I can say is, for this, I loved him as the brother that I never had. Now there... Hi, everyone. Yes, yeah, so me and my brother and I um, will be reading a poem in, in honor of our grandfather. Each of us has a name given by the source of life and given by our parents. Each of us has a name given by our statue, our stature and our smile and given by what we wear. Each of us has a name given by the mountains and given by our walls. Each of us has a name given by the stars and given by our neighbors. Each of us has a name given by our sins and given by our longings. Each of us has a name given by our enemies and given by our love. Each of us has a name given by our celebrations and given by our work. Each of us has a name and given by the seasons and given by our blindness. Each of us has a name given by the sea and given by death. Uh, and now we'll return to Rabbi Gordon. Thank you. These tributes were really truly remarkable. Capturing this truly unique man who was so adored and respected by everyone who he knew. Certainly first by his family, by clients, by organizations and causes that he served, the things that he cared about most deeply. As I said, this is the last night of Hanukkah tonight, and we light those candles. Hanukkah and the menorah are really very simple things, very uh, humble, modest. You know, the smallest Hanukkah candle, even the size of a birthday candle that might be used in a Hanukkah menorah in a preschool or in a kindergarten, no matter how simple, humble it is, the light from that little candle dispels all the darkness that one can be so consumed by. Tom brought such light to the lives of those who he touched and cared for, to our world. He was really a gift to everyone. We have honored his memory, but even more, you will continue to honor that memory and pay tribute to him through the ways in which you live, the ways in which you carry on his uniqueness, his character. Zecher Tzadik Livracha, may the memory of this righteous man be an enduring abiding blessing for all time. O oh God, we see life as through windows that open on eternity. We see that love endures and the soul endures as you, O oh God, endure forever. 
We see that the years are more than grass that withers, more than flowers that fade. They weave a timeless pattern in a world that is the dwelling place of your love and glory. If you're comfortable standing, those of you in the chapel, as we offer this memorial prayer. In Kadoshim, Tahorim, Kazoha Harakia, Masirim, Atayakar, Tahalach, La Olamal, Baal Harachamim, Isterehu Besater Kanafav La Olamim, Bitwar Bitwar Hachaim et Nishmato, Adonai Hu Nakalato, Vianuach Mishkavo al Mishkavo, Ben Omar, Amen. O compassionate God, eternal spirit of the universe, we ask that you grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence. Thomas Pick, who has entered eternity. O God of mercy, let him find refuge in your eternal presence within the shadow of your wings. Let his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is his inheritance. May he rest in peace and let us say, Amen. This does conclude the service at the chapel. The family will be having a Zoom Shiva Thursday and Friday from 7 p.m. until 8 p.m. And that link is on our website. So the same website you came in for to see the funeral, it's a separate link for their Shiva, which is Thursday and Friday from 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. both days. We will be going in procession to the cemetery. If anyone wishes to witness the interment, please go back to the same link that you were just on to see the funeral. You will be able to see the burial at Rose Hill. So just say about 2.45, plan on being uh, on that link as well, and you'll be able to see the interment with the military honors. This does conclude the service here at the chapel. On behalf of the family, I'd like to say thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for having us today. It's our great honor to be here. Those who have served are encouraged to render him a final salute during the playing of time.
on behalf of the President of the United States, a grateful nation, and a very proud Navy, please accept this flag in recognition of his honorable and faithful service to our country. In honor of my father, I present the weather report. It is currently overcast, 34 degrees Fahrenheit, one degree centigrade. Humidity, 64%. Wind from the north at five miles per hour. The barometer, 30.12 inches. Visibility, 10 miles. The wind chill, 29 degrees Fahrenheit. He would have appreciated that without question. And we're here again, only two weeks later, gathered with family. And as you all know, originally you didn't think that there would be a place in this family plot for Tom, but there is in fact. And so to be gathered through the generations into this family and to be connected through history and through his, what he added so much to that family history. And as you carry on that memory, he will remain an enduring abiding blessing. The dust returns to the earth as it was, the spirit returns to God who gave it. It is only the house of the spirit which we now lay within the earth. The spirit itself cannot die. Receive in mercy, O God, the soul of our departed Tom Pitt. Grant him that everlasting peace which you have prepared for us in the world to come. The no human eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor mind has grasped it. Still is our sure inheritance, our everlasting portion. O God, help us to understand that grief and love go hand in hand. That the pain which loss inflicts is the measure of a love stronger than death. And we cry in the bereavement of our hearts, may we be like children who know that their parent is near, who cling unafraid to the trusted hand. In this spirit, O God, do we commit all that is precious to us into your keeping. Repeat the words of the mourner's cottage. I'm not sure if you have it in front of you, if you have that reading, if you know it, repeat with me. Do you have a copy? Are there, that's, there it is. There, it is it's on uh, the pamphlet that you received. If, if you have it. Okay. So gather round if you want. Yikadal, Vikadash, Shemei Rabbah, Yalma, Divra, Pirute, Yamlik, Malhute. Bechayechon uvyomechon, chaye dechol beit Yisrael, bagala uvizman kariv vimru amen. Yehe shmei raba mevorach leolam almei almaya. Yiparach vishtabach vitpaar vitromam vitnase. Vitadar vitale vithalal shmei dekudisha perihu. Leila min kol birchata vishirata. May the source of peace grant peace to all who mourn, comfort to all who are bereaved. Amen. because it's going to take a little bit of time.
Stephen and if all the other children uh, and when else come by, you know, place some, this is earth from the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Just place some in your hand. Just place it on the closet. Come here. Let me take a little in your hand and just put it on the Some also, we will also be doing some of the regular stuff as well. We also taking some of the regular work as well. So there's mm -hmm. very simple to you think of the palm tree. Yeah, but I don't know that there's no
That's Grant Grant. Those who wish to come and help in the uh, covering of the grave with three, three shovels or, or as you wish. But be careful and just be careful whether it's slippery or not. Your footing.
This does conclude the gravesite service. Thank you. Thank you very much.